you everyone for joining us today. This is February 10th, 2022. We are the strategic planning committee of the Raleigh planning commission, and we are having our monthly meeting uh, of topics and of this particular meeting topic. We are discussing the rezoning petition process. This Ira will be leading the discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Lantman. Um, yeah, Ira Mabel planning development. Um, I'm going to be walking through the rezoning petition process. We're having this topic here for a couple of reasons. Um, first, sort of a companion piece last or two meetings ago. Now you heard from developers about their interaction with the city and changes that we're trying to make um, to development review that initiative has some relation to the zoning process, but um, is relatively small. So um, this is sort of, you know, a little bit more detail about how that works for those folks when they, when they do have to do, go through rezoning. Um, the other, other reason we're having this is there was a bit, there was a recent change text change that changed some of these steps, uh, caused a little bit of confusion as we all trip over ourselves over all the text changes going through, um, as to what was, what was the current state of affairs? So we're sort of marking this place in time as the, the latest and greatest of how rezonings work. Um, I'd be happy to answer any questions and maybe do a little bit of forecasting at the end about some ideas where, where that might be coming around for even more changes. So, um, to get started, I will say, um, Rezoning is a legislative process. Most of what we do as the comprehensive planning staff, that's me and all the other case planners, is following the steps described in the UDO. Uh, specifically in chapter 10, there's a section just for rezoning, um, along with all the other processes we do. And then another sort of more generic section about notice and um, public meetings in general that apply to everybody, um, not just the rezoning. <coughs> Um, there are other other things that control our process. There's some internal policy that's not, you know, official regulation. There's some state law, um, a few other things. But like the the vast majority of it, of the process is just following what the UDO says we have to do. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of interpretation of how we do it, but most of the time, not so much. Um, so the the recent text change TC-19-20 was adopted in June. Uh, did a couple things, um, shortened the deadline of planning commission for review, removed a deadline that staff used to have that we no longer have, um, changed the number of times you can review, uh, revise zoning conditions during planning commission review, and then a couple other things to conditions. Um, I'm not really gonna dwell too much on explaining the difference between what used to be and what was now, just to avoid confusion. It's just gonna be sort of a point in time, this is the process, um, but if you, want to talk about how things used to be, um, we can certainly do that uh, afterwards. Uh, so I, I made this sort of timeline to walk us through. <laughs> I do want to acknowledge that rezoning is usually not the first part of any of that, of a project. Um, I'm not gonna, this is just the one slide I have on this sort of the square at the front of that timeline at the top there. Um, but I do want to acknowledge it because, you know, it is people can confuse everything um, or confuse the steps. But generally, before someone even has the idea to rezone, there has there's some kind of site control um, that happens. So, you know, a conditional use rezoning requires signatures of all the property owners. So even before they get to you, there's some the property owner has to want to rezone, basically. And how any any given applicant gets there, it can be different. Um, you know, some people buy the land, some people have an option to buy the land, but haven't haven't closed yet because they're pending the rezoning. Sometimes there's some other agreement. Um, it can be all sorts of stuff, and also for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, there can be something they want to do that the UEO is not letting them do, like their current district, or they have some special idea that they want. And sometimes someone just wants to rezone you know, to do it 
they want to sell their property, see if they can get as much value as they can, you know, whatever. All sorts of things are the idea of the rezoning. Um, and this can be for all sorts of times. So I, I do have lots of conversations with members of the public. You know, we do get a zoning case in and someone will call me and say, I thought this was going to be, you know, this other thing that I heard about eight months ago, a year and a half ago or whatever. Um, so there's certainly way more ideas that happen than actual rezonings. And don't want to dwell too much longer on this because it's not actually part of our process, but can sort of muddy the water sometimes. Uh, the first official part of the of the process actually happens before the process starts. You'll notice this is a this is a big chunk of my timeline there. So I'm, we're now more than halfway gone. Um, but before before city staff accepts an application, uh, two things need to happen. <laughs> The first is they have a meeting with us. Um, these are half hour blocks or sometimes longer if the case is a plan development or some other thing, we know it's complicated. Um, but our standard is a half hour block every Friday. Um, and they meet with us and we do a sort of preliminary rundown of all the policies that we think will apply. Um, you know, if it's a sophisticated applicant, that's usually the extent of its unsophisticated app Unsophisticated applicants, we go more over the process and answer questions, and it's really just a chance to talk to staff first, give them some some hints and tips on how to how to do everything uh, to satisfy our requirements, so they don't have to do things twice. Um, and the other thing they do is hold the first neighborhood meeting. Um, so this is still the 500, 500 foot radius. They mail letters to every property owner. And then when we can determine the tenant based on tax property records, mail directly to the tenant as well as the property owner. Um, sometimes those addresses are not easily available. So for those, some of some multi-tenant sites, we require just posting a sign uh, if you can't really get. Sometimes in the tax records, you can see, you know, apartment A, B, C, D. Uh, and sometimes you can't. So uh, when, we, when it's difficult or impossible, when we, we post signs. Uh, and the applicant does all that. They mail their own letters, they post their own signs, uh, and they host their own meeting. Um, staff nowadays does go to all these. Um, they have been, you know, virtual for the past two years or so. Um, and it has been our practice to go. Uh, and this has an expiration date. So that's why the 24 week. Um, if it's been longer than six months since you had your neighborhood meeting, you have to have another one if you want to file. So, you know, we do refresh the address list, you know, make you do the whole thing again. And there are definitely more staff meetings and definitely more neighborhood meetings than wind up being actual zoning cases. So um, not everyone for sure makes it past this step. I don't know the ratio, but um, all this happens before we'll accept your paperwork. <coughs> Uh, so the official application in the door I mark here is day zero. This we have an online portal. Um, we need, like I said, all the signatures of all the property owners. We need a record of the meeting that I just described. So who attended and what was discussed. Um, and then we need physical envelopes for future mailings, which I'll get into. Uh, and there's a fee depending on which type of zoning case you're requesting. Uh, this is marked as day zero, but sometimes this can actually take a long time. If we definitely have times where, you know, signatures aren't all there, or you can't prove that the person signed owns the land, or, you know, whatever, your envelopes don't show up, or you never pay the fee, or whatever. Um, so this is listed as one day, but much to Carmen's chagrin can sometimes be much longer, depending. <laughs> um, but for the most part, it is, you know, submitted to us as a package and is generally all, all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted. Um, so for most of my calculation, when I, when I say, like, how long a rezoning takes, I'm, I'm counting from, you know, we get a complete application submitted to us. Um, <clears throat> the first phase then with the full application is called here staff review. This is the first step that's not in the UDO, but we have an internal policy of a two to three week review time. 
Um, this is for planning and development staff, but also other what we call matrix reviewers. So uh, transportation department, um, stormwater division of engineering services, uh, urban forestry, there's the, the impact section of your staff report. This is usually where all those folks will look at the request and, and send us back that information. Um, and for the most part, what they send us in this first initial review is what we go with, um, unless there is some issue that concerns them and requires additional follow-up. Uh, and this is this is this is the time where the case planner will collect all that content from all the other uh, reviewers, do an initial policy rundown. We provide a list of policies we think we're going to analyze. Um, and are really checking to make sure the application is complete. So there are some requirements in the in the UDO that you don't know until the case is turned in. Um, so I know every case needs signatures and envelopes and the fee paid and all the other stuff, but some other requirements depend on the actual content of the case itself. So like whether a trans, uh, traffic impact analysis is required or not. Um, you know, if we need an exhibit for some, if you're a split zoning, you know, or we, and we need an exhibit and what you provided is not good enough. Um, you know, if you're outside the RETJ or, and we need you to annex, you have to submit that petition too, and that you might not do that. So there's a handful of things that we won't know right off the top. TIA is by far the most common um, out of this list, but this stuff, you know, pops up on a good number of our cases. Um, and if one of those things is missing, in this case, sits as incomplete until we get the document we need. Uh, sometimes that's really fast if it's, you know, a simple exhibit to demonstrate something. It really depends on how quickly the applicant can turn that around. Uh, TIAs most of the time take a good while because the process for that is there's an agreement between the applicant and city staff about the scope. So like how far the study, the TIA will study um, they agree to that, and then the applicant's engineer will go do the study, and then transportation staff has to agree that the study was done correctly. Uh, so there is, you know, usually a bit of lead time on that one. Uh, and while that's happening, or while the case is incomplete, you know, we as complaining staff are are doing what we can to get that through. We definitely don't like a log jam when we can help it, um, but it is. It is pretty head of heavily driven by how quickly the applicant can respond uh, and give us what we want. So this is listed as weeks one through three, but this could be a year, you know. Um, I don't have PDs on this slide, but this is sort of where PDs live for a lot of their life. Take a long time. <coughs> uh, that initial review period is also when we de determine if you need a second neighborhood meeting. So most cases do, but not all of them do. There's criteria. UDO about which ones do. Um, and you can't go ahead with that until we tell you you're you're ready to do that. Um, so, you know, day zero, you submit to us, we take two or three weeks. So that's like five, uh, 10 to 15 business days to look at, the look at the application. And then we say, this is complete. You're ready for your second neighborhood meeting. Um, and that is this. You know, a, a wider mailing radius. Um, the applicant is still responsible for you know doing all their mailing. They print all their letters and stuff, all their envelopes, and um, put the signs out on the on the tenant buildings if they need to. This is where staff starts to step in a little bit. We will go out to the site at this point and put a sign in the ground on the land being rezoned itself. Um, and there's a there's a timing window so. They have to have the meeting at, at least or 10 days before the you as the planning commission can hear it. They have to notice at least 10 days. So there's like a 20 day sort of window, let's call it um, for that to happen. So this can take another couple of weeks, right? So we say you can have your meeting. The next day they say, here's my letter. You know, I'm going to put this in the mail. The meetings for 11 days later. And then the planning commission can't be for you know 10, 10 or 11 days after that. So there is a lot of a bunch of time where baked on either side of this meeting that really dictate how long this takes. But in a couple of weeks, um, 
it's pretty normal. Most applicants are, are ready to go, you know, and have our, don't take too much time to get their letters in the mail. You know, they have planned for this. This is the, also the time when staff usually will start writing the staff report and making slides and all that other stuff. So in terms of getting, getting the case prepped for you all, um, you know, this, these couple of months when we, for like, you know, eight weeks, I call it, when we're doing that, there's some lead time to get the agenda material, you know, reviewed by all the people and, and so forth. But really, it's driven by this meeting that has to happen. Um, also, at this time, we do the notice for your meeting. <coughs> so, so far, we've mailed for the neighborhood meeting before the application. We've just mailed for the this one, the second neighborhood meeting. And we mail for the planning commission meeting. Um, and this is where staff really takes over most of the responsibility for this. So the radius is the, the 500 foot one again. The envelopes come in with the application. So we get, you know, the, the actual application, which is a half dozen pages and also two boxes or whatever of paper envelopes that are required. Um, and one is for the planning commission meeting and we take care of that. And there's also a window. So um, we have to mail that within a certain day and that can determine which agenda, you know, your second or fourth Tuesday gets a case, depending on when we can get the letters in the mail and be compliant with, with all of our rules. Um, and all of this too, you know, well, I, I think I have a slide for that. So starting with planning commission, you can already see the bit of green that you're responsible for is pretty late or can be. Um, and comparatively, if we don't count the pre-app conference, which is sort of hypothetical time, you know, talking about a third of the of the rezoning time to a quarter. The the agenda, uh, so you, you now have 45 days, which is about three meetings, and that's in the, in the UDO. Um, you can request an extension from council, but you have to make that request within the 45 days. So you have to do something within 45 days, um, which is about three meeting times if you don't count fifth Tuesdays. Um, there are some cases that skip planning commission and go to community of the whole. So all planning developments, according to your bylaws, go there. Um, and all double and consistent cases go there. And that 45 days starts from whenever it is your new business um, or consent agenda. So we try to not to use consent agenda when we don't have to, because that's really eating up time where you're not actually talking about the case. We, we used it during the um, sort of an invention during the pandemic because we were having problems meeting other code requirements, but we try to not use that if we can avoid it, um, just to give you all the most amount of your actual time to hear the case and discuss as possible. Uh, and we do do a little bit of triage or agenda management, I, let's call it, um, you know, to think about if it, how, many, how many new business items we do put on, on any given agenda. I will say we, we are on the side of giving you more work <laughs> to do um, in the name of being, you know, for of customer service and due process and all that kind of stuff. But there is there are occasions where if there is a heavy schedule for whatever reason, we might push push a case by a meeting. Um, we don't like to do that and we do that very thoughtfully. <clears throat> Once you get the case on new business, um, an applicant can now revise zoning conditions one time. So this orange star, I, I put a couple places about when a case can change. Um, this is an, a new piece that was sort of the cause of confusion, but an applicant can only submit new zoning conditions once. This does not count some technical changes, and that's usually, um, or that is changes that don't modify what the um, condition is doing or meant to do, but really make it a little bit more clear or um, 
delete a, some ambiguity of how staff might interpret a condition later. So it's really just to make the language as, as um, you know, watertight as we can get it. Uh, and that doesn't really happen a lot. We, we, we make, we go pretty thoroughly in our staff review uh, period to, to try and make suggestions, you know, to do that at that stage. I don't like to make changes during planning commission review, but it does happen sometimes. Um, especially if, you know, planning commission says, I'm concerned about this impact, please submit a condition for it. That'll be the first time staff sees that, and it might need working a little bit. So we don't really have it, always have it. Hopefully the applicant, usually, you know, Tuesday afternoon, we're on our email trying to figure out what, what might be helpful for that person um, to achieve the, you know, what, what you're asking them to achieve. But timing being what it is, we don't always get that wrapped up as quickly as we can. <clears throat> Um, and then your final action is to make a recommendation to council. So I have there at the bottom the, th the three things you can do. You recommend approval, you recommend denial, or you can technically make no recommendation. Uh, although I personally will not encourage you to do that. I think that happens most often if it's a split vote, right? If, like one motion is four to four. Um, you know, that is not really... There is a thing, such a thing as a tie in planning commission. Uh, and when that happens, we, we call it no recommendation and we'll report both motions that fail is how that works. Um, and the motion does it's supposed to include reasons on why the, the request is or is not reasonable in the public interest. And then there are a lot of times questions about what happens after you see it. Um, because it's not, it's not unusual for an applicant to want you to recommend something and promise to do it, make a change later. Um, that almost always is the same question about like how that works for now, how timing works. <clears throat> so city council gets the case after you. And I, this is where I put these in numbers now. So they have to do four things in up to four things in a specific order. So the first thing that council does is receive what you say. So they get every Tuesday, Ken Bowers stands up at the podium and runs down all the, all the recommendations you made um, for all the cases that week. And sometimes Roberta stands behind him in the background on camera. Uh, if she wants to be there to explain something. Um, and so council will receive that report and recommendation and do number one, there is an opportunity for the zoning conditions to change again. So there's another orange diamond there. You know, after you've finished your work and made a recommendation, but before, e not even the public hearing, but before council sets the date for the hearing, there is one chance for zoning conditions to change. Um, so if that happens, how it works is council will receive your recommendation and then do nothing and basically wait till the next meeting. Um, they'll get those new conditions and then set the date of the hearing. So that's number two. Most of the time that doesn't happen and council does number one and number two at the same time. So they'll listen to Ken talk and then say, thank you. The public hearing for this is in a month. But there is the option after you get it for the conditions to change if council wishes to, 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 to accept them. Um, and then for the actual hearing date, it's a, the same where staff is doing the mailing again. So same slide as before for planning committee. We're putting signs in the ground and putting in envelopes in the mail or uh, letters in the mail. <clears throat> um, step three for council <clears throat> is they actually hold the public hearing. And that is really two more chances for the zoning conditions to change. So the public hearing, they can change again. So this is a you know, city council, the mayor will say uh, the words out loud, I open the hearing. That opens the hearing. We have done the advertising. It's been in the newspaper, all that kind of stuff. Um, and then, you know, both sides for and against will speak similar to how it works at planning commission. And the conditions can change again during the hearing. So how that'll work is the council will not close the hearing on that night. 
right? They'll leave the hearing open for some amount of time. And that's if they want to make sure there's the venue for more additional comment from both sides about what, what new conditions might occur. Um, the hearing at some point, though, does have to be officially closed. And that's the mayor says the words out loud. I close the public hearing. Once that happens, there's a third chance at this city council stage for up to 30 days for new conditions to be submitted. So, you know, for the most part, um, this is a, I don't want to call it a technicality, but it's the format, right? So here, holding the hearing open and closing the hearing and accepting new changes really are just, you're signaling that you're expecting a lot more opportunity for comment on what they are. Um, and that really is council's discretion on what they think the changes are going to be. So if they're relatively minor, they might close the hearing. It does let them schedule it for a different time of on the agenda, you know. Um, but effectively, there's two more times. Um, now, the applicant has the option at this stage to change the conditions so they are less restrictive than they used to be. Um, if that happens, there has to be another hearing. So we go all the way back to step one. So I don't know since this has been in the UDO, if this has ever happened, maybe David York has a better memory. I don't think it has. It's pretty rare. Um, but I think the idea behind this is, you know, sometimes you, yeah, all sorts of reasons why this could happen. It's, it's pretty rare though. Um, and unlike you, council only has two two options here. They either approve or deny. There's no such thing as no decision. Um, no decision is no zoning change, right? So that's basically a denial. Um, most of the time, you know, I put 16 through 20 here. Most of the time, council will get your recommendation and schedule the public hearing for either two or four weeks later. And the public hearing lasts one meeting. And so they do all their work from start to finish in a month. Um, but depending on how it works, it could be longer. And what I didn't put, like, all the different avenues for committees and stuff, they have a lot of choices in how to handle their cases, but. <clears throat> uh, and then after a whole lot of other stuff happens, so usually they'll be, this applicant will be back in front of a whole different group of city staff people looking at the subdivision and permitting. Uh, I don't do any of that work, but. Um, you know, all the other requirements of the UDO, they will build the thing that they that they want, and then they'll see us again when we inspect it. Um, and this can also take years and years. So the the like two squares at the top there on the left and right can be most of the time are really, really long compared to the you know five to six months I just described um, for the public. But we're sort of acknowledging that we are and a sometimes very important, but relatively short step. Uh, so just sort of a recap, um, the pre-submittal, you know, can be as short as a couple of weeks if an applicant's ready to go. But um, like I say, we have the expiration date of six months. Um, staff review time of two months is pretty normal. And that's really for all of the to accommodate a lot of the mailing windows and getting the paperwork all squared away. Um, usually it's not for a reason other than that. Sometimes there's, um, other issues that we have to work out with other reviewers and the applicant or whatever, but, but for most cases, it's, it's that long just to get everyone properly notified. Um, and then you can, you know, sometimes new businesses on a, on a, in a planning commission meeting and voted out that meeting. So it could be as short as a week, up to now 45 days. I feel like um, most of the time, and Travis reports this to you, you do get your new business cleared in one or two meetings, um, which is pretty great. And the same thing for council. There's there's an extra step baked in and that there's always at least two times they hear it because right they hear it from you and then they have the hearing. Um, but generally also, most cases get through, you know, in five weeks or so. Um, so the way a case evolves over time, 
<clears throat> the pre-submittal period, a case can change all sorts of ways, basically any way they, uh, an applicant wants. If, if an applicant hosts a meeting and, lets, and says, you know, I have these three parcels and I want to rezone them office mixed use, and they hold the meeting and tell all the, the neighboring property owners and residents about that, and then the application they submit is for 10, you know, twice as many parcels and for a more intense zoning district, um, we won't accept that, right? That's telling, telling the, the public you want one thing and then asking for more. Um, so we, off, we, off, we will have them redo that meeting. The other way is what we advise is the other way is okay. It's okay if you say, you know, I, I'm thinking about rezoning to this district and your actual request is for less. Um, but we want that the neighborhood meeting to, to lay out the full scope of what, the, what you think the request might be. Um, but this is a little bit of a point of confusion for the public. The intent of this step is for the case to change, right? The idea is you hold your meeting with the public and your neighbors, and they are concerned about something and you do something to your case to address that concern. That is the whole idea. Uh, is this an opportunity for a case to change? So we don't really restrict how often or how your your request can change. Uh, we just want to make sure that the public understands what what's gonna what the request is. Um, the same is sort of is true for staff review. You know that the case change there for all sorts of reasons. Staff might have suggestions or ideas, or a condition might be illegal that we want you to do something about. Um, and this includes the second neighborhood meeting. So the idea is the same. You have a whole other neighborhood meeting and you might want to change your case to accommodate the concerns of those people. So that is the point of that. Um, the planning commission review, we're now down to once, once and only once. And then, like I said, council has up to three times distinct times the zoning conditions can change um, without doing the public hearing over again, in which case you're back to sort of like a loop, a hearing loop. I do wanna say this is way more technical of a description of the process than we give to most people who call and ask about it. We do have information that's geared more toward the public about like who is planning commission? What is it like to go to a meeting? Um, that stuff is made and on our website. Um, if you search for rezoning, we have a flyer we used to hand out in person. It's got a flow chart on the other side. Um, and it doesn't talk about all of the sort of nitty gritty details because most people don't want to know that. They want to know, you know, when is this meeting going to be? Who are these people? Um, you know, what to expect? Um, when should I email them? Like, how do I, how do I participate? So we do have that material. We're always looking to, to have more of that and better versions of that. Um, this is where I'll say city council recently got a, got a presentation from our new, the director of the office of community engagement, um, sort of laying out her scope of what she would like to do. One of those things was working with us about potential improvements. So we're definitely excited to think about ways to make this process easier or uh, more clear for people. So there might be, a, maybe that'll be a process change. Maybe that'll be a text change. I don't think we know for sure at this stage. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something we think about a lot and listen when people have an issue that we can, can identify and maybe try to correct. Uh, so that is my presentation. Be happy to answer any questions about that or anything. That was really great, Ira. Thank you for that presentation. I think that that was very clear. Um, hope this is useful in a lot of ways. Any questions from commissioners? Commissioner Godinez. Thank you so much, Ira, for that. Um, my question and curiosity is mostly um, if you were to describe an average person that is submitting um, this sort of rezoning petition, who is that individual? Yeah, so definitely 
most cases that we see have some sort of attorney representation. Um, you know, I definitely would say the majority. Um, in terms of who the property owner is, that that is pretty varied. So it's definitely seems to me anyway a pretty good mix between a developer, um, sometimes an individual, just regular person, <laughs> property owner. Um, it can be all sorts of stuff. A lot of cases do have attorney representation. Now that you do not, you are not required, and we definitely do get people who are regular people, which by that I mean not a land use professional interested in rezoning. Um, and <laughs> I don't want to say we give special treatment to anybody, but we definitely do make sure that those folks get enough time with us. Um, that they feel comfortable understanding how the process is going to work and what they need to do. So, you know, everyone is required to have the meeting, the pre application meeting with us. Uh, and we schedule those, you know, we have 30 minute blocks every Friday morning. But um, I know I always personally point out when it's sort of a, just a member of the public who owns property and is thinking about rezoning, that is not the only time we are extremely available for those type of applicants if they need extra help. Or are confused, or that's not enough time um, to be available to them. And most language attorneys don't need that. You know, they do this all the time, and it's um, they're comfortable hosting a neighborhood meeting and and doing everything legal. Um, and that, for sure, is a lot of the requests that we see do have an attorney involved. Um, but that is definitely not required, and it's staff is committed to making the process. If you, to not have making you feel like you need an attorney to be able to do this. Commissioner Godinus. Just a quick follow up. Um, I, I love that it's all written and, um, and especially the 1 pager that you were saying and that on the back, it has, um. Uh, flow chart um, and the reason why I was asking is as our city is becoming more and more diverse and just from the last few meetings where some of the uh, property owners uh, were um, you know probably folks whose second language is English I'm curious what accommodations are being made to ensure that folks are really understanding that process and that the neighbors as they're receiving these letters know what that is about um and especially since there are the tenants versus property owner situation as well and so i'm just curious how uh language accommodations are uh being made in this mm -hmm. process sure great question um so Comprehensive plane does have a couple of staff members who speak spanish in various degrees of fluency um and so we do, uh, when we do get either people walking to our office or calling us because they see our, our phone number in a letter, um, we can accommodate that almost all the time. It might not be right then, but for sure those are available. I just heard, heard Carmen do an admirable job <laughs> the other day. Uh, try to at least get um, an understanding of what a person who was calling her and speaking Spanish was was doing. There is there is not we do not require in a in the letter for from the applicants to have anything in a language other than English. I think that's um, certainly something we can think about, and maybe it wouldn't be too difficult to add. Um, at the very least, some information about who to call if you need help reading that. I think I will speak on behalf of our staff to, to be happy to look into that and maybe make a change. Yes, I would like to make that request sure. and just so yeah. that as people are receiving that information, they really do understand what it's about and just thinking of some of the pockets in our communities where a lot of the businesses or a lot of the residents are um, uh, monolingual um, or more Spanish dominant or other language dominant. Yeah, I think that's a great suggestion. Mr. Fox. 
Dr. Fox. Um, I think, uh, Ira, when you're doing the EJ screen, there's the tab for low English proficiency. Mm -hmm. I think was an initial recommendation when that text change went through last year, but um, just would want to mm -hmm. also su support that again as being something that is generally commonly used. Sure. Well, even more simply than that, you know, I think we provide applicants with a template. Like we make them do a mailing to announce their meeting. Um, I'm thinking it would not be too difficult to add some language in Spanish somewhere really visible that says, if this is confusing, please call. Um, and that we have staff people available to help that person figure out what's going on. Um, I think that's something we can do pretty quickly without even caring if they're what the proficiency is. It should just be in every letter. Um, so I think that's a great suggestion and we can probably do that pretty soon. Um, I just want to make sure, um, are you saying that some of your staff members, uh, these aren't interpreters, these are people who happen to speak Spanish, correct? Yes, ma'am. Um, I, I just want to underscore that sometimes the burden does fall on people who are multilingual to add something else to a job that they actually didn't sign up for. Uh, and so I just wanna make sure that if the city is going to advertise something like this or inform the community that this exists, that there be um, specific resources for interpreters because otherwise we would be taxing employees whose job primary responsibilities are something else and not to serve as interpreters for the city. Yep. Definitely understood. I will, I will say, um, the way comprehensive planning uses it is generally has been either staff in comp planning or in housing and neighborhoods whose job is engagement. Um, their job might not be rezoning, but it is, you know, someone who before the, the community, uh, communications analyst, um, in housing and neighborhoods or comp planning staff and I, I don't, everyone in comp planning is. Some part of your job is public engagement. Um, so definitely understand what you're saying. When we do planning projects um, and have big meetings, we we do hire like actual interpreters. But our more our for our division anyway, our on call staff I think are um, the capacity is there, and they are comfortable you know having public engagement be part of their job description. But totally understand. We do not. You know, ask our zoning enforcement people, who some of them speak Spanish, to come in, because for that very reason. Um, and so far, it's been okay. I think if we'd ever do, we are very lucky and have a couple of very strong, slash, extremely fluent Spanish speakers, who work with us. I think if that were ever to be not the case, we would definitely have to have something more formal for sure. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Carmen informed me that we have a member of the public who wished to make a comment. Uh, good afternoon. Is that me? Yeah, it's you, Larry. <laughs> um, thanks for allowing me to speak to you today. I don't want to take much of your time. I'm more or less sitting in to listen. Um, but one thing I want to bring to everybody's attention. Um, I live in the Midtown area. We've gone through a lot of rezoning requests. Um, to us, because we don't have CACs, well, I shouldn't say we don't have CACs. CACs are coming back. But the point is that it falls apart right in the first step of the process in that while developers or owners are required to have a public meeting, the information that's given out in the public meeting is really a waste of time. Um, a lot of times they'll hold the public meeting before they get the review back from planning. Um, I've seen the reviews that come back from planning in that first stage, they're very complete. And I wish we could work from that as a template when we have the first meeting talking to the developers. It would save both the public and I think you, um, because a lot of those issues that are on the public's mind are also in your reviews. So it'd be nice to have that as a template to start with. So I guess what I'm requesting maybe as an improvement is that they don't rush to have that first public meeting. Uh, it doesn't do 
very good because they won't lay out where the buildings are. <clears throat> I know they're not required to, but I've seen some developers do it. The other thing we always ask is, you know, how will the people or the businesses be impacted? We can't tell, and in some cases, we're still waiting for that to come back from the developer. And the other thing I wanted to get to real quick, <clears throat> the tenant notices. For some reason, um, and I've talked to some of the property managers, when you send tenant notices, if the property managers are diligent, they will actually deliver it to make sure everybody gets it. Otherwise, I can't be sure whether they get it or they don't get it. But the one thing we've observed is out of maybe a development with 300 units, we get maybe two people come to a public meeting. That tells me one of two things. They either don't care, um, recognize that maybe they can't influence their fate, which I think is more likely, or they just don't understand the significance of what's going to happen in the near future. And in, in our case in Midtown, there are three rezoning issues right now, and we've heard nothing from the people that are actually affected other than the property managers. Um, so this it's broken somewhere, and I don't know where it's broke, but a lot of the people, the neighbors around those developments have more interest than the people who actually live there. And I'm trying to figure out how to break through that wall and get more participation from them. And I think maybe some of it is tied into the way notifications are occurring. So I can't help you much there because I don't know the answer. So I just want to make myself available. I think the system is from the public's viewpoint needs to be improved so that you don't wind up with a lot of people complaining when it finally gets to the planning commission stage. For the most part, it's too late. The developer has made their plans. They know what they want to do. And you don't get many conditions um, accepted by developers at that point. It's got to occur before that. It has to be in a more informative process. And that's what I'd like to see us find a way to do. So, and at that, I think I'll just Listen. Thank, Thank you for your feedback, Larry. Chairperson Fox. Um, Larry's comments just made me think of something. There may be another um, issue as well with the time of day that a meeting is offered. So I often get a notice, but I have to pick up children or do other things. And so I'm not able to go to a public meeting at night. And so I'm, I'm wondering that 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 might be part of it. Um, I do know, I, I've actually found that to be um, by silver lining in the cloud of the pandemic, I've actually found that to be helpful that a lot of those neighborhood meetings have been recorded and I can go and watch them myself if I want to. Um, another key feature of that is you can turn on closed captioning in different languages if you'd like to, um, depending on what format they use. Um, is there, um, there's not a requirement that folks go back to in-person neighborhood meetings, is there? Like, could, could that potentially continue as an option, I guess, is my question. So the provisions that we have now for virtual neighborhood meetings were put in place because of the pandemic. We vetted that with council and they specifically say that the, the virtual option is available at times when in meeting uh, in person meeting is not practical because of emergency orders. So we probably will once council chooses to return to in person and boards and commissions are asked to return to in person. We will probably also uh, make that same request of applicants that they return to in person. Um, that we did that. Gosh, when was that? Council went back to in person briefly. It was sometime, last year. Sometime last year. I'm not really sure which month that was. Pandemic brain. Um, it, and it didn't last very long, right? But um, we are anticipating that when council goes back to in person, that similarly neighborhood meetings would go back to in person. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate um, the deep dive into the topic. 
Ira, thank you for doing that. And I hope it's helpful. And um, one of the initial thoughts too was as we have, you know, new planning commissioners come on and, you know, we kind of experience the timeline, but um, it's nice to have it kind of in front of us. So thank you very much for putting that together for us. Um, with that, um, I would, um, I think I'm gonna look to Chairman Fox because I think she knows a lot of these rules would we like to vote this uh, particular topic out of the strategic planning committee and back to the planning commission? I believe with no recommendation. If that is considered a motion, I will make that motion if it is, if I need more information. I guess it's also a question to staff if there were uh, contemplations with this being edited or changed in the near future, if you would have a reason for us to keep it where it is. No, I mean, I think, um, like I said, we are anticipating working with the Office of um, Community Engagement for some changes um, that may take the form of a text change if it, we need to. So you will definitely see that in the normal text change menu. Um, and then any other changes that we do, I think will probably be reported to you the way we have in the past. So when we made the adjustment to the staff report, you know, um, as part of the director's report or you know, some other thing where we tell you our process is changing. Um, be happy to report to this committee uh, separately if that, if and when that also happens. I think, um, but there is no really a need from my point of view to, to hold this item. With information. The only thing I'll say to Mr. Helfand is that uh, I feel your pain getting people to participate if you can figure out how to do that reliably, then you'll win the Plenty Nobel Prize. So I hope you let me know when you do it. Um, but you have, I understand and you have my sympathy. Commissioner Godinez. Forgive me for my ignorance, um, but kind of to what the gentleman was speaking on, um, is there a video or something that is more pithy than the flow chart? But that conveys that same information in a different modality than something that is read. Uh, and could this body make a recommendation or a suggestion or something to community engagement to make something like that accessible? Item. So that's something we've already identified with community engagement as a need that we need a sort of an evergreen video about this process for the rezoning web page. Um, so that's definitely already in the works. You're welcome to make that recommendation, but we're we're gonna do it anyway. <laughs> anyway, um, amazing. <laughs> absolutely agree that that's something. Um, and it, when I talked with the director of community engagement, it was like, well, that's so incredibly obvious. Of course, we should have that. Uh, so I really welcome that feedback from her, um, and we are looking to make that happen soon. I hope this is this is helpful in that process as well. Um, so I think uh, Commissioner Godin is. I think this this meeting here will also be published. So um, that's helpful as well. Um, we did get um, a comment from the public from uh, Carmen posted that there is a request from the public to hear the text change process completely described in this same manner. So um, I don't know. Again, I kind of look to. Uh, Chairperson Fox, for her knowledge of these rules, if we need to have that as a recommendation that comes out of Planning Commission. Um, but I am open to that conversation topic. Um, I do believe we need to vote from the full Planning Commission to put something in committee. Um, and I'm also, I'm anticipating that Bynum may pipe in and tell us that they have that in the works and they're working on that with the, is it neighborhood college or I, I'm not remembering. Those. Yeah, so we are working on a planning and development academy that will launch. I want to say in the fall. Um, and that would include that process for sure. Um, I don't know if the text change program is planning an informational video. Like the one I we just referenced for the rezoning process, I don't think that that um, process gets the. It doesn't touch as many people the way 
as personally as the rezoning process, and it doesn't get, I would say, as much um, interest. Um, so I don't know that they have that planned or not. Um, and I also wonder if that is, it's, it seems weird to me to discuss that in the strategic planning committee versus the text change committee, just as a, as an aside. Chairperson Fox. Um, and then I didn't mean to ignore your motion earlier. I would, I would second motioning this out um, to the full body with no recommendation, just as information. Great. And I guess all in favor with a show of hands. Thank you. That is unanimous passes. Um, David York, did you have a comment that you wanted to make? I was just going to say that the part of the text chain, there's two types of text changes. There's a text change that changes the language in the UDO book, and then there's zoning condition text changes which change conditions in an existing conditional use district. And so the, the latter follows the rezoning process with the neighborhood meetings and all that. And so I don't know, I don't wanna speak for, for Bynum, but I don't know whether that would be included in the rezoning video or whatever, but uh, just wanted to make note that there are those two different types of of text changes. Some are as quote personal as a rezoning next door to you. Yeah, J you know, David, it's funny you mentioned that. I think of the um, the text change to zoning conditions. It so so very closely follows the rezoning process. It's it's a um, kind of a semantics distinction between the two things, right? The, the only difference is the map doesn't ch the zoning map doesn't change. Because uh, the base district and the um, designational map doesn't change, so I would think that the informational video we would bring forward would address those kind of equally for the TCZ and the uh, rezoning. Um, if I may, too, the one last thing is, you know, we had this discussion and we'll report it out and have this video and you hear of other stuff. But if if at any time any of you or any other planning commissioner sees or experiences or hears about some other part of the process that you think we can fix. Uh, you know, we're more than happy to listen to that. I think that has definitely come up in the past. A lot of the equity changes were results of planning commissioners during, you know, report of members asking staff to look into a change and see if we could do it. Um, we're happy to make our process better. So, you know, I wrote, definitely took note of the suggestions that Commissioner Godin is saying. I think they sound doable. Um, and we'll certainly be added to the suite of whatever else we're we're talking about with Taisha Hinton, but um, you know, other stuff too. You let Travis know or say it at a meeting or something. Um, we try to be pretty as accommodating as we can, provided it's it's not something that we have to do for a legal reason <laughs> or can't do for a legal reason or you know whatever. Um, yeah, glad to glad to make our process better. Well, thank you again, Ira. Bynum, thank you for your, all of your support and leadership. And David York, thank you for yours. And uh, Chairperson Fox for your leadership as well. And Gordonez, Commissioner Gordonez, thank you very much for all of your feedback. All right, everyone. Carmen, thank you for hosting. See you again. <laughs> thank you. Bye now.